Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope, hopefully you all had a good weekend. So today we're going to continue our discussion on neural networks. Um, just to recap a little bit, last time we talked about backpropagation and the goal was to find the partial derivative of our loss function with respect to uh, all the weights. In particular, just for notational simplicity, we're going to consider um, kind of one uh, one row of uh, one row of some of the weights so that's going to be denoted as w l j dot transpose so so far what we have done is we have computed the partial derivative of l with respect to the last hidden layer and that turned out to be w l transpose partial l partial y hat so this part partial l partial y hat that is known because we know the loss function and then this part is basically coming from applying the chain rule. This is partial y, partial hl. We can actually apply this generally um, to look at the partial derivative of L with, with respect to any of the hidden layers. So it turns out that that's going to always be uh, wl transpose times partial l, partial z, l plus 1. Whereas z is just the, um, the pre-activations at layer at the next layer, so layer L, uh, L plus one. And finally, we had a general expression for partial L, partial ZL. So the partial derivatives with respect to the pre-activations, and that turned out to be this expression. So we have a diagonal matrix with, uh, with a column of zeros. So this is basically explicitly writing out what we talked about last time, where because the last component, um, Uh, be because uh, Z only had NL minus one components, we have actually a row of zeros at the end. So we're going to work this out today again, just to show you explicitly um, this last row of zeros. Okay, so then the next step was actually to compute, to actually compute um, this gradient. Um, we're going to continue doing that today as well. So now switching to the written notes. So we would like to compute, uh, sorry, not sure what that is, partial z um, l plus 1, partial w l comma j comma dot, and then transpose. Because when we multiply this by partial l partial z l plus 1, we would actually get partial L, partial W, L, J dot transpose, right? So this is basically the gradient of the loss function with, with respect to some of the weights. Ultimately, that's what we want when we uh, apply gradient-based methods. So this term is kind of the main thing that we, want, we would like to calculate right now. So let's write that out again. So partial z l plus one, partial uh, w l j dot transpose. What does this equal to? So in order to see this, let's uh, write out what z l plus one equals to on the right side here. So that actually equals to w l h l, where h l is the post activations from the previous layer. Okay. Okay, let's expand this out just to be very clear. So so let's first write down WL. So I'm this time I I'm, I'm going to write down um I'm going to write this down assuming that HL has NL components. So so HL has NL components, including the one, including the one. So, so that means our W, uh, the our WL matrix should also have the right dimensions as well. So we have W one one, W one NL minus one, right? 
and then finally we have the uh, the bias term so so this gets multiplied by HL which is going to be HL1 HL2 all the way up to HNL minus 1 and then finally we have a 1 at the end so that was the convention we took um, so hopefully the number of columns here is the same as the number of components of HL and that that is indeed true so now how many rows do we have for W we need to have the same number of rows as the number of elements of Z L plus 1 so this uh, kind of goes up all the way up to W so this is uh, we're in layer L and then it goes up to N L plus 1 but then we have to subtract 1 from that because Z always has one fewer component compared to H okay and then same thing but now we go, go up to W L N L plus 1 minus 1 comma so in this case uh, is N L minus 1 lots of indices here and then B sub N L plus 1 okay so that's what uh, so that's what Z L plus 1 equals to Okay, so now we can kind of go back to this side uh, on the left hand side we can continue our left hand side by computing partial ZL plus 1 over partial WL transpose WLJ dot transpose so what we're really saying is we want to take the gradient of ZL plus 1 with respect to one of the rows one of the rows um, of this matrix so if we write this down this would be I guess I'm using a different notation here uh, there are many too many indices I guess over here I have L as a subscript so let's keep it that way for here so WL the J row 1 and then here we would have WL J and L minus 1 so that would be all the way up to here and then we will have a B, B, J over here at the end. So we would like to take the gradient of this vector Z L plus 1 with respect to one of the rows here. And in general, this is going to be um, the derivative of a vector with respect to a vector. So this is a Jacobian. So we can write down what exactly that is. So in the first um, in the first row we're going to have all the partial derivatives with respect to the first component of the input okay so let me just write this down sorry One, so the first component of ZL plus 1 okay and then if we keep going now still um, so now we have to take the partial derivative of L, uh, ZL plus 1 2 and then with respect to WLJ1 and then this goes all the way to the last component of Z and the last component of Z is going to be so uh, ZL plus 1 would have N L plus 1 minus 1 components okay and then with respect to WL J1 okay so that's the first row and then eventually we get to eventually you um, I guess we can we can go down and then eventually we get to the last uh, the gradient with respect to the last component of W 
Okay, and how many components is that? So actually it turns out to be So over here, we can see that it goes all the way down to WL, sorry, it's, uh, it's actually we're looking over here. So it's going to be WLJ, and then how many components do we have? We have NL minus one components. And I suppose if we want to do it properly, we actually need another, we need another row here for the bias. Okay, and then it keeps going until we get to the very end here. So partial z l plus one, comma, n l plus one minus one, over partial w l j. Actually, in this case, it would be it would be b j, I guess. So maybe we can move this up. So this one would be comma and now minus one. And then lastly partial z l plus one and l plus one minus one partial b j. Okay. So it will turn out that most of these are going to be zeros. Um, Okay, and to see that, let's rewrite let's rewrite this part. Let's write out the full z over here on the left hand side. So this is actually gonna be z l plus one, comma one, first component, z l plus one, comma two, and then all the way down to z l plus one, comma j. That's the j throw. And then eventually it goes all the way down to Z L plus one comma N L plus one minus one. So one one of the things you'll notice is that if we look at the J's element here, and let me start to use different colors now. Okay. So this part is actually equal to this vector. So the inner product of this vector with HL. Okay. And notice that the Jth component of Z doesn't depend on any of the other rows. It only depends on the Jth row. Right? And similarly, if you take a look at any of the other components of Z, they only depend on the corresponding row of W. Of course, all of them would depend on H. So now we can simplify this quite a bit. So for example, if you look at this term, uh, the first term here, we're looking at partial Z L plus one comma one, which is gonna be, so this part is, So we're looking at uh, partial z l plus one comma one uh, with respect to um, w l j one. So th this is always the j because of the index j. Um, we can see that z l plus one comma one does not depend on the j th the j th row of w. So this thing is going to be zero, and that's going to be zero because this is just the second component of z. And the, all of these are going to be zeros except for the jth row, uh, except except for when we get to the jth column. So when we get to the jth, jth column, it's going to be z uh, l plus one comma j partial z l plus one comma j with with respect to uh, partial w l j one, and this is actually this is the the only column where you will get a non-zero element. If we look at any of the other rows of this uh, Jacobian, we get the same thing. So for example, if we look over here, this is uh, partial z l plus one comma one 
over partial WLJ and L minus one, right? So, uh, so again, we're looking over here. Does this does this element of Z depend on this row of W? Well, it doesn't. So, so this partial derivative is going to be zero, and that's going to be zero. And the only non-zero things we get in every row is going to be only in the jth, only the jth column of this Jacobian matrix, right? Everything else will be zero. So now the only thing we have to work out is what is this column right here? Okay, it turns out that this column is just going to be H L. And that's because and that's because uh, we have Z L plus one. Uh, maybe we can just work this out term by term. So you will see very soon. Okay. So maybe we can scroll down a little bit. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna continue to use green because this kind of bit of this new computer is a bit finicky. So we have zero, zero all the way down to here, and then we have a bunch of zeros. until we get to the jth column. In the jth column, the first element is going to be z partial z l plus 1 j over partial w l j 1. So, so, how, so what is the derivative there? Well, you, you just have to look here. So z l plus 1 j is going to be equal to the inner product here. So, so we're going to have a term that looks like WLJ1 times HL1. Okay, so maybe we can... Yeah, I guess we can write this down as well. So, just kind of running out of room here. Maybe I'll scroll over here. So ZL plus 1 comma j equals to w l j one times h l one plus I'm just doing this inner product over here so w l j two h l two plus and so on right all the way to w l j n l minus one times h n l minus 1 and finally plus bj times 1. So now when you take the derivative of this zl plus zl plus 1 j with respect to the first component of this row of w so wlj1 the only term that depends on uh, wlj1 is going to be the first term and then the, the partial derivative is going to be hl1. So we can record that down here. So, okay. So this is HL1, the first component of HL. Following the same logic, if we now take the partial derivative of ZL plus 1, J, with respect to WLJ2, while well, only the second term will uh, will involve WLJ LJ2 and then therefore the partial derivative is going to be HL2 so this is going to be HL1 HL2 all the way down to HL and L minus 1 that's the second last term before the bias term and then finally we have uh, we have BJ over here Sorry, uh, the BJ is actually part of the the row of W here. So then the derivative with respect to BJ is going to be one, right? So okay, this. Let's... 
So it's going to be 1. And then after the jth column, again, everything will be all zeros. OK. So that's basically, finally, we have partial ZL plus 1, partial WLJ dot. And we can record it up here. Okay, now going back to using black. So this is going to be a matrix of all zeros. So now I'm going to use vector notation, zero vector, until you get to the jth column. In the jth column, you're going to have HL, and then you're going to continue with all zero columns. So this is the jth column. Okay, so now we're basically done. So we have now computed um, the partial L, partial WLJ dot, which is this thing here, which we need in order to do gradient descent. And that is going to be given by this matrix multiplied by partial L, partial ZL plus 1. Now we can go back to the slides, and then we can look at uh, just look at the final result again. So basically, we would like to compute the gradient of L with respect to a row of weights. And to do that, we're going to use the chain rule. So we're going to get partial L partial Z L plus one uh, on the right here, and then the crucial point, which is bolded, partial Z L plus one partial W L J dot transpose. Let me get the pointer out. OK, so that was this part. Um, so the only thing we have to figure out is basically the bolded part. And we have seen um, on the written notes that um, note that ZL plus 1 comma J, so that's the Jth element of ZL plus 1. That's just going to be equal to a, an inner product that we saw. And that basically means that um, for the Jth component of Z, the gradient with respect to this uh, row of weights is going to be HL. But, but the same partial derivative, uh, the same gradient for any other component of Z, so here is written as partial ZL plus 1 comma J prime, where J prime is not the same as J. So, so any of the components that do not correspond to the Jth row of W, um, all of these gradients will be 0. And that basically gives us um, uh, the result for this Jacobian, which is going to be all zeros except for the jth column, and the jth column will have a HL. And to keep track of the dimensions of everything, this is going to be, uh, so the dimension of this matrix will be NL times NL plus 1 minus 1. So I guess I'll leave it to you guys to verify this. And finally, putting everyth everything together, we have um, the uh, the gradient of the loss function with respect to one row of weights. So that's going to be, again, the same expression here, but now we can plug it in. So it's going to be a matrix of all zeros except for the jth column being HL multiplied by partial L partial ZL plus 1. And we know, and we know what this is because we have previously, uh, because we have previously determined it. So that was this part, right? And then of course, partial L, partial Zs are going to be are going to depend on partial L, partial Hs, and we also know what that is. We can always work backwards from the loss function layer by layer in order to obtain um, uh, all of these gradients with respect to the, with respect to the weights. Okay, so that was a lot of math uh, to to work out um, prop back propagation in your networks. So what we're going to do next is to, well, we're going to do more math a bit later, but for now, let's do something a bit more fun. We're going to look at this, what's called a neural network playground. So you guys can also go on the website and play around here as well. Okay, here we go. So you can see a lot of things that appear up here. So let, let's go through that a bit slowly. Um, let's actually just switch to regression, just because we have been talking more about regression so far. So on the left here, you have possible input features to use. So 
right now we're using x1 and x2. Um, there's other possibilities as well. So, and then we can visualize each of these input features. So for example, x1 looks like this. Um, so on the, basically on the right here, you can see a graph with orange and blue. So orange means negative, and then white means zero. And then the more blue you are, the more, uh, the more positive uh, the function value is, right? So x1 basically looks like a gradient from left to right, a gradient of, uh, it goes from orange to blue from left to right. And then x2 goes from orange to blue as you go from bottom to the top. These input features, while well, there are other input features, so for, so for example, we also have x1 squared, which kind of looks like blue, it looks blue on both sides, because when you square something, it's symmetric, left, right, for x1. And then for x2, you get the same symmetry, but then up, down. We also have some other ones like x1, x2. You can see that the first and the third quadrants are blue. That means, well, that's because when both x1 and x2 are positive or negative, the, their product is positive. And then you have the orange in the other two quadrants. We also have sine of x1. So this is periodic horizontally and sine of x2 periodic vertically. So these input features right now, only x1 and x2, they get multiplied by some weights, right? You can, if you mouse over these, you can see the weights and then you get the, um, these weights when, when you do the inner product of these weights, uh, and then you apply some activation, you get the next layer. So these are the HLs, um, here. So this entire column is HL. And then this is the first component of HL. I guess in this case, H1, just the first hidden layer. Um, you can kind of see a visualization of uh, each of the neurons as well. Um, so after some linear combination of X1 and X2 with some activation, for now the activation is 10H, we get this slightly slanted picture over here. It kind of makes sense, right? You start with like uh, just X1, X2, which, which is kind of like horizontal and vertical which have horizontal and vertical level sets. When you do a linear combination of them, you get something slanted, right? And then if you take different linear combinations, you kind of get, um, you, you get different directions in terms of how the color changes. You also get different degrees or the colors changing um, at a different rate. So for example, for this one, the colors are lighter. Um, so the, the slope of the function is less. Okay, so then you get all four of these. All four of these are then connected to another hidden layer. And then again, you can see all of the weights. And then you can see uh, what the hidden layer looks like on the right as well. And finally, these the last two hidden layers get, um, get multiplied by some weights and then you get the final function, all right? So right now, Right now, all of these weights are kind of random, so the final function doesn't really look like anything. Basically, what we want is that we want the resulting function to be very blue at the points, at the data points which are very blue. And we want the function to be very orange at the data points over here, which are very orange. And in the middle here, the data points are very lightly colored. We also want the function to be lightly colored as well. So that's basically regression, right? We want, we want our function, our model, to, uh, our model output to match the data points. So right now with some random weights, they don't really match. We kind of see light blue everywhere for our function, um, but we can always train the network um, by pressing this button over here. You can also train by looking at epoch by epoch. Right? So if I go a few epochs, you can kind of see that with the learning rate of 0 0.03 and no regularization, even after two epochs, we're getting a much better function. And we can keep track of the loss, the training and testing loss over here. All right, so, okay, apparently for this problem, because it's a very simple data point, right? The data point is basically just going up diagonally. Um, we can train this very easily, right? You can always press this, uh, press the go button to let it train automatically. Okay, so that was pretty easy. Um, actually, in this case, if we use the intuition that the vertical and horizontal functions uh, can be easily can easily be combined together to form kind of like a diagonal function, 
to me, it seems like we don't even need these hidden layers. We can simply find the right linear combination at the very beginning. So let's try that. So let me remove some hidden layers. Okay, and then just directly go from input to output. And that should still work based on my intuition, right? Because we just need the right linear combination to get a diagonal uh, function over here. Okay, actually we, we get that right away as you can see, right? So initially we randomly initialize the weights. Um, the direction of the function is completely wrong, but after even maybe one epoch actually, we're already getting something very close. Okay, so in this case, um, so sometimes it does help to be able to visualize your inputs and, and kind of the data points. Maybe we can, maybe we can try a different example. So in this case, so you, you can see that our data points are, they have six different sections. So it's blue over here, here, and here, and then orange in these three locations. So obviously when we just have two inputs like this with no hidden layers, uh, no, no amount of training is going to give you a good fit, right? So this is when we need to add some more hidden layers. So let's let's add back our hidden layers. And let's just try to train it to see if we get something reasonable. Okay, so you can kind of see that with two hidden layers, um, you can also add more units if, in each hidden layer if you want. So we're able to get something that's kind of reasonable. Okay, so we can play around more with this. You can change the learning rates. Um, for fun, I guess I can restart this. If I change the learning rate to be like three, which is really big, you kind of see that these weights are going to NAN, I guess. So that probably means that something blew up. Our step size was too large. Therefore, when we, we move too much in any direction during training. So that causes our training to diverge. So now let's go back here. This. Uh, I guess we have to restart, right? If we use a suitable training uh, learning rate, then we should get something reasonable. Okay, it's kind of interesting to visualize some of these, right? So in the beginning, it's pretty simple function. After one hidden layer, in the first hidden layer, we get some functions like this. And then after two hidden layers, we start to get some pretty interesting uh, shapes. And finally, when we combine the last hidden layer, we get some function that seems to match our data pretty well. As a last demonstration, I wanna just do a bit of uh, classification. So we haven't, really, uh, we haven't really talked about classification, but the visualization is similar. We want the function to be blue where the at the blue data points, and we want the function to be orange at the orange data points. So for example, with this, uh, so let's try it here, right? So we can kind of see that we are training and it's not so stable. So let me decrease the learning rate here. Okay, so we can see that we're getting something kind of reasonable. Okay, but in this case, I would argue that this is too complicated. We don't need so many hidden layers. If we want a function that is kind of radially symmetric, to me, I feel like maybe we should just include x1 squared and x2 squared because we can always square, we can always do x1 squared plus x2 squared and then that should give us a paraboloid, right? A paraboloid would have the right shape for the data. So I'm gonna, I will use my intuition here. Again, remove a bunch of hidden layers, remove the unnecessary features. And then if I click train, yes, you can see that, okay, we're getting exactly the shape we want. And even this very simple model with no hidden layer is able to fit this function. Okay, obviously if you if you if you take a data set like this, which is much more complicated, it's definitely not gonna work, right? Okay, so now we should add back some features, maybe more hidden layers, because it seems like a very complicated function, and maybe I'll just give each hidden layer more units, right? Let's just include everything and see what happens. Okay, so maybe you can play around um, after the lecture as well to see if you can get something better than what I have. You can also play around with regularization. There's L1 and L2, so we mostly covered L2. And then you can look at the regulariz regularization rate as well. 
So definitely play around with this at home to get more intuition. Um, okay, so, so let's go back to the lecture slides. Okay, so now we're gonna um, do, do a detailed example of computing um, the gradient of the gradient of the loss function with respect to uh, a row of weights in the first layer. Um, and then we're going to be using the chain rule over and over just to illustrate, um, just to give you a concrete example of backpropagation in neural networks. Um, so we're going to be doing this more slowly in the written notes, but in the end, we're going to get a big product. And from this big product, we're going to get to see potential problems involving vanishing gradients and exploding gradients. So we're going to now work this out in the written notes. Okay, so we're going to start with what we know about the multilayer perceptron. So we have um, Okay, so let's start from the beginning. We have Z1 equals W0x, that's the input. And then H1 equals Psi of Z1. And then we continue Z2 equals W1, H1. And then H2 equals Psi of Z2. Okay, and this keeps going until we get to HL equals Psi of ZL. And finally, our output Y hat e equals WL HL. And of course, we need to then compute the loss function. Right, and then finally we can compute um, L of Y hat. Okay, so that's the forward pass. In the backward pass, we have already did all the computa all the computations we need to get all the gradients. So let's write those down as well. So we're gonna go backwards this time. So going backwards, we have partial L, partial H L equals to WL transpose partial L partial Y hat. And the last part is actually known because we know um, because we know the loss function. Okay. Okay, going backwards, we have partial L partial Z L. So now just a generic index we have this matrix G prime of Z L one diagonal matrix G prime of Z L comma N L minus one. And here I'm going to take the convention that we have a column of zeros over here. After some discussion with one of you guys on, um, on courses, I think this is a better way to go because it's the clearest. Okay. So again, just to um, just to make it very clear here, um, this is actually coming from the convention that uh, let me just write this down over here. Convention layer. Okay, so maybe let's let's write it another way. So the convention is that. HL has NL components. So then ZL has NL minus one components because HL will be applying the activation function on Z and then appending a one at the end. So more specifically, we actually have HL would be G of Z L1, G of Z, L2, and so on, all the way down to G of Z, L, N, L minus 1, and then a 1 at the end. 
So um, this is the convention we're going to take. So basically, when you take the Jacobian of HL with respect to um, so this part is actually the Jacobian of HL with respect to ZL. So basically, you're going to get um, the number of columns is equal to the number of outputs. So that's going to be the number of components in HL. Um, and then for every column, we're going to be taking, um, for every row, we're going to be taking a different partial derivative with respect to a component of ZL. So for example, for the first row, we everything is going to be zero except for the first component. That's basically coming from um, this G this G of ZL1. And then when we get to the last component, uh, so the last column here, because the last because the last output is one, um, the gradient with respect to any of the inputs is going to be zero. So that's why we have a column of zeros at the end. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. We're going to take this convention. So let's keep going, writing down our results from computing all of these gradients previously. Okay, so next one we have partial L partial HL that equals to WL little L partial L partial Z L plus one. And then finally, with respect to all the weights, we have partial L partial W L comma J comma dot transpose because it's a row that actually equals to um, a bunch of zeros until we get to the jth column where we get where we have HL so this is the jth column and then the rest of the columns are going to be zeros again okay and then multiplied by partial L partial Z L plus one Okay, so this is all, so this is the forward pass on the left, and then in the middle we have the backward pass with all the different gradients, and on the right we're, we're just explaining the convention that we're going to take right now. So now we're going to use all of these, and we're going to find, find partial L, partial W, zero, J, dot. Okay, so that's basically one of the rows of the weights W0 over here. So we're going to start from the very top here and then we're going to simplify. Okay, so I guess we don't need this part, so we're going to delete that. Okay. So I guess we can just begin by writing down directly what we have in the formula up here. So this is actually equal to, so we're going to be looking up here. So it's going to equal to a bunch of zero columns. And then HL, but, but then now we have H0. So H0 is the same as X, right? If you look up here, H0 is will be the same as X the zeroth hidden layer, well that's actually the input, so that's going to be x, and then we're going to continue with the columns of zeros. Okay, and then now that's going to, so we take that and multiply it by partial l, partial z, l plus 1. Right, so now l is 0, so this is going to be partial l, partial z, 1. So we can now continue to work with this expression but then expanding the last term every every line. So now we're gonna expand the last term. What is partial L partial Z1? While looking over here, with L equals to one, we actually have G prime of Z11 diagonal G prime of Z1 comma N1 minus one and then the rest of the matrix is all zeros with also a row, a column of zero at the end. And then we need, uh, and then we need this part. 
And sorry, this should be a, this was supposed to be a little L uh, over here. Okay, so now we can just write that down. Okay, so now we still have partial L partial H one over here. So now, of course, the next thing we do is we're gonna expand out this part. So now maybe it's uh, time for copy pasting. Let's see if, if we can do this properly. Okay, so I, my writing is wasn't so good, so this is a little harder than I thought. So, but maybe I can move this down a little bit and that will work. Okay, that didn't work so well. So maybe we, maybe it's faster if we just write everything out again. Okay. Yeah. So let's write everything out again quickly. So this is the diagonal matrix involving G prime. And then now we're going to expand the L partial L partial H1. So then for that, we're going to be looking up here. And that is going to give us W1 transpose and then partial L partial Z2. So you can kind of see how the indices, well, first of all, the variable at the end goes from Z to H, but then eventually we get to the next Z. And then you can kind of imagine that it's going to keep going, right? So. So maybe now I don't want to write everything out, but this is the same, the matrix with all zeros except for one column. And then that's going to be the same. And then we're still going to have the W1 transpose. And then now we're going to expand out, um, we're going to expand out this partial L partial Z2. So for that one, we're going to be looking here again. So that's going to give us this diagonal matrix. G prime of Z two one diagonal G prime of Z two now N two minus one all zeros on the off diagonal and then a column of zeros here and then we're, we're going to still have this partial L partial H two at the end and you can kind of see that this will keep going and then it's going to be the same thing over here same thing over here. So I'm going to avoid writing out everything repeatedly, same thing. So now we just have to expand the last term. And the last term gets expanded to W2 transpose partial L partial Z3, right? So, so we can just keep going like this until we get to the very last layer. Okay, so now to make things a bit neater, I'm going to collect some of these um, I'm going to collect some of these terms into a product. So you will notice that So you notice that in the beginning we have this part which will always be here. So the zero columns with an x with more zero columns. And then we're going to have a diagonal G prime matrix times some weights. So the next part is going to be some diagonal G prime matrix. Now I'm going to use the index L here to be general. So up to G prime of Z L comma uh, and L minus one. Off diagonals are zeros and then we have a column of zeros and then multiplied by W uh, W L so it's the same index, WL transpose, and then multiplied by partial L partial Z three, which is what we had. So now we're, instead of writing this thing out twice, we're gonna have a product of L equals to one up to um, 
up to two for now because right now we only have two indices. Every time we, exp we expand out partial L, partial Z2, uh, Z, partial Z over here, we're going to get another um, diagonal G prime matrix with another W transpose matrix. So then we can keep going. So if we do one more step, just for illustration, we're going to get the same matrix in the beginning. And now our product is going to go from L equals to one to three of G prime Z L one up to Z prime, uh, Z prime G prime Z L and L minus one. Okay, so now, because we have included two more terms, okay, we still need the WL transpose. So now we have included two more terms in this product, we can increment the index on the Z. So then this is gonna keep going. We can, each time we increment um, the index for Z, we're gonna get two more terms in this product. So then we keep going until the very end in the last step. Okay, let's just write down the last step. Same matrix over here. Eventually, we're gonna get to, so let's do the second to last step. L equals one, all the way up, all the way up to big L minus one. And then that's gonna give us, again, G prime of Z L one, all the way up to G prime of Z L and L minus one. So a lot of writing, but the idea is pretty simple. And this one is gonna be uh, still WL transpose. And then outside, we're gonna get partial L, partial um, so Okay, let me just make sure this is correct. So we should have So actually we need to uh, we can't have this yet. We we need to write another just explicitly explicitly write out another diagonal matrix. So we're going to put a bracket around this product. And then this is going to be partial L, partial Z L over here, right? So just still following the same in the indexing before it went up to three, and then outside here we have partial L, partial Z four. But now it goes up to L minus one. So right outside here we have partial L, partial Z L. Okay, so now we're going to expand this out. So instead of this. It's going to be a diagonal G matrix. So this time with index capital L. It's diagonal G prime matrix, actually. Okay. And then we're going to get partial L, partial HL. Okay. So this last part is partial L, partial ZL. And then I think we'll just write one more line and then we're gonna be done. And then this part, this part is just going to be W, L, W capital L transpose, partial L, partial Y hat. So now putting everything, everything together, our final result is going to be um, collecting our last 
uh, this last part into the product and then at the end we, we're still gonna get a partial L partial Y hat okay so one more time this time the product goes to goes from L equals to 1 to capital L of this G prime diagonal matrix So all of this in, is inside the product, and then the only thing that we haven't covered is partial L, partial Y hat. So that is actually going to be the gradient of the loss function with respect to a row of weights in the very um, uh, th that are multiplying directly the input. So that that would be zero. So the jth row. Okay. Okay, so over here we have the jth column. Okay, so basically if you want to compute the gradient with respect to a row of the of, of the first set of weights, it's going to be this uh, this matrix with mostly zeros multiplied by a product with the di a diagonal G prime matrix times the other weights. And then finally times the gradient of the loss function with respect to the model output. Okay, so now let's take another look at this on the slides. So on the left, um, this is our multi-layer perceptron model. We start from x multiplied by w0 to give us z1 and then apply the activations to give us h1. And then we alternate between Zs and Hs each time each time increasing increasing the index until we get to H capital L, and then uh, multiplying by W capital L get, gives us our output. When we do back propagation on the left, this is all all of the key results from before. So now, if we want to compute partial L partial W zero J dot transpose, we begin with um, a a bunch of zero columns, except for the jth column, which is going to be x, because that's going to be h0, right? h0 is the same as x, and then fill in the remaining columns with zeros. Um, this matrix is going to be n0 times n1 minus 1. So it would be good for you guys to check the dimensions of all of these matrices. So I will put the answers here, but you guys should go back and check all of these dimensions. Okay, so we have this matrix multiplied by uh, partial L, partial Z1. So now we're going to be expanding this part and the expanded part is going to be shown in blue on the slides. So partial L, partial Z1, we're going to be using um, this result on the left. So we're going to get a diagonal G prime matrix as we have looked at. And then multiplied by partial L, partial H1. So the Z becomes an H and then we we also get a diagonal G prime matrix. And now we're going to expand out partial L partial H1. The expanded result is shown in green here. So that's going to be using this result. Um, for index L equals to 1, we have W1 transpose partial L partial Z2. So we can kind of see that now we're on index 2 for Z. So this is going to keep going. Right, so that's what we had on the on the previous slide. And next, we're going to leave everything in front the same, and we're going to be expanding out partial L, partial Z2. Whenever we expand out partial L, partial Z, it's going to give us a diagonal G prime matrix. So that's what we have here. And then we have the partial L, partial next H. So in this case, H2. When we expand that out next, we get the green part. So whenever we expand out partial L partial H, we get a W in front, and then the index goes to the goes to uh, the index increases and the H becomes a Z. So that's what we have here. And again, uh, we're going to keep doing this. So it's going to be a product of all of these diagonal matrices times the weight matrices. I'm going to write this all out in a product form. So 
is going to go from L equals to 1 to L minus 1. So that's going to be the second last step. We'll still have a partial L partial ZL at the end after, um, after this part. So now expanding out partial L partial Z capital L, we're going to get another, the last diagonal G prime matrix, and then partial L partial HL. And finally, expanding that out, we're going to get W capital L transpose partial L partial Y hat. And we're finally done. So then the last step is basically to bring this additional um, additional diagonal matrix multiplied by W capital L into this product. So now, it's, now everything can be neatly written as this matrix with zeros and X multiplied by a big product involving a diagonal G prime matrix and WL, and then finally multiplying the gradient of L uh, the loss function with respect to y hat. Okay, so hopefully you can follow that. If not, I suggest that you guys go back and revisit this. Um, in particular, one thing I haven't really taken the time to go over is the dimensions of all of these matrices. So this matrix is actually going to be n0 times n1 minus 1, as I mentioned. And then each of these diagonal g prime matrices are going to be nL minus 1 times nL. All of these weight matrices are going to be nL times nL plus 1 minus 1. You can see that this matrix is indeed able to multiply this WL matrix because the, the number of columns here is equal to the number of rows in the next matrix. And then in addition, um, the number of columns of W are going to be is it's going to be equal to the number of rows for the next diagonal G prime matrix. So all of this works out. Um, so this WL is going to be is going to have this dimension, except for W capital L, in which case we don't need to have the minus one here because um, in the last step, if I go back here, in the last step, uh, when we when we multiply WL HL to get Y hat, we actually do not apply an activation function. So that's why the last WL um, does not have a minus one for the number of columns. Okay, and finally, for the loss function, uh, gradient of the loss function with respect to Y hat, the dimension is actually going to be n L plus one times one. So please go back and check all of these dimensions and then just double check that everything is able to multiply together. Now we're going to take a 10 minute break and afterwards we're going to be discussing um, the issue of vanishing gradients, starting with a review of the operator two norm.
Okay, let's take a look at this. So recall that the two norm of a matrix is defined to be the supremum over all vectors with one norm um, of AX. So actually let's probably do this on the written notes. Okay, so recall that the induced two norm of A, a matrix A, so this is also called the operator norm, is equal to the maximum possible value of uh, the two norm of AX, uh, if we are allowed to plug in any X such that the two norm is less than or equal to one. So this is basically a measure of um, suppose you in, suppose we're allowed to input any vector um, of norm one to norm of one, and let it multiply by a. What is the maximum possible two norm of the resulting vector? So that is what the induced two norm of a means. So this sup is supremum. Um, for now, you can think of this as maximum. And it turns out that this is equal to um, sigma one one of a. So this is the largest largest singular value of a. Okay, so now we're going to do a bit of algebra just to see. We're going to do a bunch of things that we're allowed to do in math, and then we'll get some interesting results. So let's, um, so first let's apply the definition of the operator norm. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply a by a vector that has a norm of 1. And the particular vector we're going to choose to multiply by, let me actually put the vectors here, is going to be the vector y over the two norm of y. So when you take any vector y, divide by its own two norm, the resulting vector over here has a norm of 1. So this thing has two norm of 1. Okay, so now we take a multiplied by a unit vector. So that's a vector with a two norm of one. And then we take its two norm. By definition, it must be less than the induced two norm of A, which is again equal to sigma one one of A. Okay, so that's that's the first thing we, we have. This is simply applying the definition of the induced two norm of A. Okay, so next we're going to multiply, we're going to look at look at this expression in a different way. So again, we're going to have a times uh, y over two norm of y. And let's take a let's take a look at the two norm of this in a different way. So this is actually equal to so again, we have a bunch of things inside the two norm, but in particular, we have a constant, which is the two norm of y. So we can pull that constant in front. So it's really one over the two norm of y times a y and then the two norm of everything. And then, well, again, this is a constant, so we're going to put it out in front, outside of the two norm. OK, so, so now we have two. So that's the second part. So we're, we're not going to put everything together. So from one. Uh, actually from 2, so now we're going to apply 1, sorry. Uh, so this part is equal to to this part, right? So these two are equal based on 2. So now using 1, we can say that this is less than or equal to the 2 norm of A, which is then equal to sigma 1, 1 of A. So now, taking these two parts together, we're going to rearrange. So we have 1 over 2 norm of y, a y 2 norm equals sigma 1 1 of a. And by rearranging, we get that when you take any vector y, multiply by a, its 2 norm should always be, sorry, this should be a less than or equal to its two norm should always be less than or equal to the two norm of y times sigma one one of a.
So let's look at this on the slides. Okay, so the same thing again. Okay, just skip, let me get the pointer out. So um, first we recap the definition of the induced two norm of A. So then using this definition, we can say that A times Y over two norm of Y, the two norm of that should be less than or equal to sigma one one of A. On the other hand, we can simplify this expression a different way and we get one over two norm of Y times A Y two norm of that. And then putting, putting so now this thing is now gonna be less than or equal to sigma one one of A. So now if you multiply uh, y, two norm of Y on both sides, you get that the two norm of AY should be less than or equal to sigma one one of A times the two norm of Y. Okay, and this applies for any matrix A and any vector Y. Okay, so now we're gonna use that fact to look at vanishing gradients. So we're gonna put, uh, we're gonna put up the um, the kind of the calculation result of partial L partial W zero J dot transpose. And that was this big expression here. Um, so basically what we have is that we have this matrix of mostly zeros except for the J column multiplied by a product of a bunch of nearly diagonal matrices uh, and then multiplied by these weights. And then finally multiplied by partial L partial Y hat. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the two norm of the left hand side and therefore the two norm of the right hand side as well. So the first step is basically slapping a two norm on both sides. Next, we're going to notice that everything on this side, so everything except for this matrix, which is everything inside a product and partial L partial Y, that's just a vector. So basically we have a matrix multiplied by this whole thing, which eventually will just be a vector. So that's why we can actually bring this, bring this part out. So now, so now basically this is the A part of this property and this whole thing is the Y part. So, so that means that this whole two norm is the two norm of AY and that should be less than or, or equal to sigma one one of A which is this matrix here, times the two norm of the vector y, which is this entire thing here. Okay, so that's the first step. Even though things look very complicated here, um, we simply have a matrix times a vector. And all you have to do is to keep in mind what is the vector, what is the matrix. Okay, so it looks like the text is cut off, so uh, yeah, let me fix that right now, actually. Okay, let me get the pointer out again. So the next step is, okay, so now we're done with the first part. So we're going to look in, inside here. And we'll notice that this is actually another matrix vector multiplication. And we're going to call the first term, so the, the first two factors in this product, where L equals to 1, we're gonna bring that in front. So that's gonna be G prime of Z11 diagonal all, all the way up to G prime of Z1 N minus one, N1 minus one um, times W1 transpose. So that gets taken outside and then we still have the rest of the factors inside the product. So now the product goes from L equals to two up to big L. Everything else stays the same. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so what we're gonna do is view this whole thing as another matrix vector multiplication. And the vector uh, and the matrix being this G prime matrix involving the G primes, and then the vector being everything else. So because we have now a matrix multiplied by a vector and we're taking the two norm of all of that, that is gonna be less than or equal to sigma one one of the matrix times the vector, which is everything else. So ideally, I guess I will be writing this down by hand, but I thought the concept wasn't so hard. All you have to do is to recognize which part is a matrix, which part is a vector. So hopefully you can see the pattern now. Um, we always look in the, inside a two norm, and the two norm is always gonna be a matrix multiplied by a vector. And in the next step, 
the matrix will be W1 transpose, and the vector will be everything else. So W1 transpose can then be taken outside um, with the less than or equal to sign, of course. So now we have sigma 1, 1 of W1 transpose times the two norm of the vector, everything else. So we can kind of imagine we can repeatedly do this. Each time we can pull out um, this diagonal matrix and then using a less than or equal to sign, we can turn this into a sigma 1, 1 of this matrix. And then we can do that again with the W with the next W weight, right? So I'm gonna do this a little more bit more quickly now. So we have a sigma one one of the first G prime matrix and then the first weight. So then we can do it for L equals to two. So now we will have another term. So now we can actually write this as a product. So L equals so product of L equals to one to two of sigma one one of this diagonal G prime matrix times sigma one one of um, WL transpose, right? L from one to two. And now we still have the remaining part, which is gonna be the vector that we had um, that stays inside a two norm. But now the kind of the index goes from three to big L now because two of the terms came out in front. Okay, so hopefully you can see the pattern. If we keep doing this, then everything in here eventually will become sigma one ones of all of these matrices multiplied together. And then in the end, the only thing left will be partial L, partial Y hat, the two norm of that. So this is actually the final vector that we still have remaining in, in the end. Everything else comes out inside this first product, now going from little L equals to one to big L. And then the product involves um, the sigma one ones of these matrices instead of the matrices themselves, as we, as we have seen uh, earlier. Okay, I'll give you a moment to absorb this. So probably it will be helpful to, um, after the lecture, to work this out all, your, all by yourself, just to write everything out, just like we did with um, kind of this exercise of taking the gradient uh, with respect to the first, uh, a row of the first set of weights, All right? So that was this um, whole exercise that we did earlier. So we can do a very similar thing, but now just taking, taking things outside of the two norm and then making them sigma one ones, uh, of course, with a less than or equal to sign. Okay, so basically, um, after all of this, what we have is that the two norm or kind of the length of the gradient of L with, with respect to some of the weights is less than, is upper bounded, less than or equal to a bunch of sigma one ones multiplied together. The sigma one ones, remember, are gonna be the singular, the largest singular value of each of these matrices. And you have many of these singular values multiplied together. And that, tur it turns out that this is where the vanishing gradient problem can come. So recall that these G functions are activation functions and typical choices are something like a sigmoid and hyperbolic tangent, soft plus and ReLU. If we use the sigmoid or the tan H uh, activation functions and some of these Z values happen to be pretty large or pretty small, Right, so let's say greater than or equal to five, so all the way out here, or maybe all the way, um, maybe all the way down here, for example. In that case, G prime will be very, very small. So all of these G primes would be very small. And actually, if you look at this diagonal matrix, the, sing the largest singular value of this matrix is actually the largest element of the matrix. So it's basically the largest G prime when evaluated at each of these pre-activations. So if all of the pre-activations Z, all of the components are pretty large, let's say greater than or equal to five, or maybe even less than or equal to negative five, something like this, then all of these values would be very, very close to zero. And therefore Sigma one, one of the G prime matrix would be very, very small.
because of this, um, this whole product would be very small because one of these terms is very small. Okay, this is especially the case when you have multiple layers, when this happens across multiple layers. So now you have several very, very small numbers multiplied together, which upper bounds the two norm of the gradient. So you kind of see that now the gradient, the two norm of the gradient will be very, very small. So this is actually known as the uh, vanishing gradient problem. So that's why with multi-layer perceptrons with many layers, um, so this is an example of a deep neural network. If we use the sigmoid or the hyperbolic tangent activation, it's actually very easy to have to get into this vanishing gradient problem. Okay, and similarly, we have the exploding gradient problem as well. So previously, we have derived an upper bound on the gradient magnitude. So this is basically um, the two norm of the gradient is upper bounded less than or equal to this whole thing, right? And that was kind of a problem because many of these terms could be small. On the other hand, we can use another linear algebra fact, which is that the smallest possible two norm of AX given a one norm input, um, that turns out to be sigma NN of A, where sigma NN is the smallest, smallest singular value of A. Using a very singular, uh, using a very similar argument as before, we can actually show that the two norm of the gradient is actually lower bounded, greater than or equal to a big product involving a bunch of sigma nns. So, so in this case, um. In this case, I guess the sigma n will be fine, right? Because it's a lower bound, so it's fine that sigma n n might be small. However, uh, if a lot of the sigma n n's of the weights are large, and that happens across many layers, um, then we could have an issue of exploding gradients, um, especially if we use the ReLU or the soft plus activation functions, because the the ReLU and soft plus functions, they have a gradient of one on, on the right side. So then so then you would have basically um this made the sigma n of sigma n n of this these matrices being nearly one, multiplying by the sigma n sigma n n's of these weight matrices, which could be very, very large. So when you have a deep network, when you have many layers, and this keeps happening over and over, um you would have many large numbers multiplied together. So um, so this is the exploding gradients problem. So in this case, uh, we need to very carefully choose um, a good initialization of the weight matrices to make the deep neural networks trainable to prevent these exploding gradients problem. So ideally, we would like to initialize the weight matrices so that their singular values are close to one. So maybe some of you already have some experience with training some deep neural networks, and maybe you've been also using some um, some ways of initializing the weights, right? Um, I think all of that is really good uh, from experience. You'll definitely get to know how to um, kind of the nuts and bolts of machine learning. How do you initialize the weights, for example? How do you deal with exploding and vanishing gradients? But here uh, we take a mathematical look at why these happen and why some of these solutions um, are actually helpful. So usually we actually want to initialize the weight matrices randomly. So it's kind of difficult to control their singular values. Um, in practice, uh, we actually use the Xavier initialization. Um, so here you basically initialize the weight matrices uh, randomly with a normal distribution centered around zero. So zero mean and a, and a diagonal variance uh, with two over NL plus NL plus one as, as the magnitude. Okay, so remember NL, uh, that's the number of uh, number of uh, neurons in layer L, and then NL plus one is the number of neurons in NL plus one. We also have the He initialization, 
um, here we uh, we initialize the weight matrices very similarly, but with a larger variance. So we won't really go into this too much. So initialization is uh, is basically one way of trying to get the training training process started without exploding gradients. Um, another way of dealing with exploding gradients is to do something very similar to L2 regularization. So, um, so basically, uh, the first part, so this is the loss function that we're defining, which is the function of all the weights. We're going to define that to be the sum of all of the loss losses from every data point plus lambda times the Frobenius norm of all of these weights, excluding the biases. So the Frobenius norm, which is sub f, um, recall that that means that you're, we're basically squaring all of the elements of the matri matrix and then square root. And then basically then we square all of that, so then we get rid of the square root. So this will actually um, avoid exploding gradients because we actually, we're actually limiting the size of, uh, of the elements of W. And that will reduce the chance that W will have large singular values. So it turns out that uh, the, the induced two norm of any matrix A is equal to the largest singular value of A. Um, but the Frobenius norm of A is actually equal to the square root of the square of all the singular values. So the square root of the sum of squares of all the singular values. So basically, if we penalize the Frobenius norm, we're indirectly penalizing the largest singular value of A. So that basically is very helpful for reducing the chance of exploding gradients. Um, of course, we know that with L2 regularization, that's also very helpful for um, kind of just avoiding overfitting. Okay, so so another way of doing kind of another way of controlling the size of these weights is to do layer normalization. So here we're gonna pre uh, we're gonna scale the pre activations of each hidden layer. So basically, um, suppose that so suppose that after multiplying by some matrix, we simply just get back. Um, um, uh, sorry. Suppose we take a vector, multiply by some matrix. Suppose that this gives us the same two norm. If this happens, this implies that the singular values of A must be all ones. So using this fact, we can actually change the way um, the pre-activation becomes the post-activation. So basically, originally we had ZL plus one equals WLHL, and then HL plus one equals Psi of ZL plus one. So what we're going to do is we're going to rescale Z so that um, Z has norm of one. And if we, if we do that for every layer, then both the uh, kind of both the norm of Z and H are going to be similar. And that will basically force W to have um, uh, to not have any elements that are too large. Okay. So, so now, so this is the original, uh, original formula for multi-layer perceptrons with layer normalization, we still compute L plus one, uh, Z L plus one equals to W L H L. But afterwards, we're going to compute a normalized version of L uh, of Z, which is just, which is just going to be, um, summing up, taking the average of all of the values of Z, all of the values of the components of Z. So that's going to be Z bar. We're also going to compute um, kind of the variance of all of the components of Z. So that is actually written by ZL plus one, the vector, minus Z hat, which is a number, times a vector of ones. So basically what this looks like would be every element of ZL plus one will be subtracting Z bar. So that's kind of how we write this down. And then we take the two norm of that. So basically this is like SL plus one is how much deviation we have 
um, kind of on average from each element of ZL to the average of ZL, ZL plus one. Okay, so now that we have computed Z bar, which is the mean and S, Z bar and S, which uh, and S is the variance, we can now compute H, L plus one. And H, L plus one is gonna be psi applied to this whole thing. So what is this whole thing? So let's take a look by writing everything out. So first, um, yes. Uh, so first, we still have Z L plus one equals to W L H L. But instead of just simply getting H L plus one being psi of Z L plus one. So we're not doing this right away. We're going to first compute Z bar L plus one, which is just gonna be kind of the average of all the components of Z. Okay, so just make sure we get all of the indices correct. So sum from I equals to one up to N L plus one and then minus one. Um, of Z L plus one comma I. Okay, so we compute kind of the average of Z first, and then we we subtract all of these, we subtract the average from all the components of Z. So, so basically we have Z L plus one minus Z bar L plus one times a vector of ones so what this looks like is just going to be um, Z L plus one, one minus Z bar L plus one. So basically we're just taking all the components and subtracting the mean. Okay, this keeps going and then eventually we have Z L plus one comma N L plus one minus one. And then minus z bar l plus one, right? So that's um, so that's basically what this z l plus one minus z bar one represents. And we're going to now define s l plus one to be the two norm of this uh, two norm of this vector. Okay, so now. Once we have all of these, we're going to um, be able to define H L plus one. So I'm gonna write this not in the same order that you see on the slides. I'm gonna start with, mm, let's see. So Z, uh, so we're gonna start with this vector, Z L plus, yeah, I think my hand is always touching these scroll bars. I, I don't know how to disable that, so that's why I keep scrolling around. Just give me one second. Okay, maybe if I move all the way here. Okay, so we have Z L plus one minus Z L plus one bar times the vector of ones. So that's basically this vector over here. You can think of this vector as the vector z subtracted, subtracting its mean. So basically it's the vector z centered at zero in some sense. So we have this vector. Suppose that we divide this vector by s l plus one. What we would have, so let's say one over, what we would have is basically the vector z except that it's gonna be centered at zero. And also um, it's gonna be normalized because we divide it by its standard deviation. Okay, but uh, layer normalization takes this one step further. Instead of just doing this, we're going to have a bunch of other things as well. So first of all, we have a scaling factor. So don't worry about this one. 
this is not the important part. The important part is this diagonal matrix diag of V L plus one. And then we have a plus U plus U L plus one at the end. And we're going to apply the function psi to all of this. Let me expand that out a little bit. So we have psi of this constant divided by the standard deviation and then multiply by a diagonal matrix with the L plus one with the uh, with the elements of the vector V L plus one. So this V is actually additional parameters in the model. So these are unknowns, kind of like the weights that we have to train. And this diagonal matrix goes all the way up to V L plus one. And then the number of elements is N L plus one minus one zeros on the off diagonal elements multiplied by multiplied by this vector that we had before so with all the elements of z subtracting their means so this basically gives us so we kind of normalize first, and then we introduce additional parameters which allow us to individually scale each component again. And then in the end, we can also introduce some offsets to each of these elements. So now our H becomes much more complicated. We're basically separating out um, the scaling and translation of Z uh, into several steps with many more uh, with many more trainable parameters. Mm -hmm. So this will help us control the norm of all the Zs and Hs, and hopefully um, it will allow us to um, have singular values of A or um, the singular values of the weight matrix W which will be, um, which hopefully will have sing singular values much closer to one. And this will prevent us from uh, getting into issues of exploding gradients. So now coming back to the slides, ho hopefully this is more clear now. Um, so this is layered normalization. There are other related normalization schemes. Um, batch normalization is a common one. There's also instance normalization group normalization. All of these try to normalize pre-activations, the Zs, or the post-activations, the Hs, in some way. Okay, so let's review a little bit. Um, which of the following would not be an effective way around optimization difficulties caused by exploding gradients? So take, let's say, two minutes to think about this, and then we'll go over it afterwards.
Okay, let's take a look. So the first one, perform gradient clipping. This is something we covered a while ago in the optimization part of the course. So this was an effective way of uh, reducing the chance of exploding gradients. Second, making the network shallower. So this, this means that the big product we saw um, would have fewer terms. So that does make it less likely to have exploding gradients. Third, use a non-saturating activation function like ReLU. So this is actually not an, not an effective way of um, reducing the chance of exploding gradients because the ReLU, the non-saturating activation functions like ReLU, they have, um, actually they, they are the cause of the exploding gradients a lot of the times. Um, if we use a non-saturating activation function like ReLU, we will definitely alleviate exploding gradients, but we might get into issues of vanishing gradients as we discussed earlier. Okay, adding weight decay. So this is basically like a L2 normalization, uh, L2 regularization uh, for neural networks. So this is actually effective because we are, we're directly restricting or we're directly penalizing any weights that have large components. Okay, and the adding layer normalization also helps as we just discussed. And initializing the weights using one of these uh, heuristic initializers, they also definitely help. So hopefully you got all of that. Okay, that's it for today. We'll see you guys next time.